And good morning again from the uh, Culligan Water Studios, broadcasting live and direct, better water, pure and simple. 7.07 a.m. as we move along this morning, 69 degrees, and as promised, at uh, 7.07, we uh, have in the studio, live from District 4, City Councilman Steve Massengale. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Good morning. So so last night was the big... um, Council meeting every Thursday night, yep. I guess, or every other Thursday night. Yep. Isn't? We spent well, several, two a month. We spent several hours down there last night, uh, talked about many things, including um, talked a little bit about public s- safety facilities as that proposal continues to develop, discussed a little bit about annexation, worked on some annexation items, and um, worked a little bit on neighborhoods last night on a z- zoning deal, so had a great council meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, on, this, on the annexation, bring me up to speed, um, Specifically, uh, is is Lubbock? I mean, does does Lubbock just need some more area to develop because we are short of uh, de- undeveloped area? Or well, it, what what is the specific reason that we're looking to annex new land? Well, there's several different components of annexation that we took up last night. One, the first is the two twelve agreements, which were created by the prior council in early sixteen and. What it did was as they were annexing south, they, um, they carved out holes in our city limits. So right now, you may not realize this, but you can drive south, you can drive out of the city and back into the city, and you might be out of the city and back in. Create Swiss cheese, which, I mean, for the record, I would not have supported the 212 agreements. It's created a, a tremendous mess uh, when we look at... Where does the fire department stop? Where does the police department stop? Mm-hmm. Do they do, do do they work across the street? Do you know all these things? As, as you look at these, we've determined these these two twelve agreements were probably uh, problematic to begin with. So when these individuals signed to these two twelve agreements, um, they uh, agreed to be exempted and be out exempted from tax and exempted from from being included in the city so long as they did not change their current land use. And so a couple of folks started construction or, you know, if they were using the, 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 for X, I think one one piece of property, someone decided to start selling fireworks on it. Well, that changes the the use of the land and uh, terminates the agreement. So had a couple situations like that last night. To your point, we had some 212 agreements where some land had exchanged properties and developers came and said, please, we'd like to be annexed. And that a lot of what we did last night was developers uh, coming in and saying, I'm ready to build in this area, but I want my development to be in the, in the city limits. And th- that doesn't mean we're going to automatically run p- plumbing or, 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 or run um, – uh, streets out to them, but they're even going to be able to help participate in some of those costs as we develop. Yeah, well, see, that's what I was thinking because when you annex something, you're, I, I suppose, you're required to some extent to provide utilities, and that can be a very expensive proposition. It depends on what stage of the development it is. If it's existing structure, uh, you know, it can be built out as as things develop, or the the property owner can can bear the cost to bring them out. You get the soft services. You know, you get EMS, you get, I mean, you get police, fire, animal control and some things. But, um, you know, typically when an area is developed, those services are paid for by the developer to bring them out to the development. So uh, as far as that, how many uh, are, are, if I remember correctly, the 212 agreements were for 20 years? That's correct. I believe you're you're right about that. Are we going to be, as far as the council's concerned, is is there just going to be, continually be these small annexations of the 212 agreements as different things happen and i I think um uh the market will put pressure on them to terminate the agreements i mean you know those 212 agreements were in south lubbock Mm -hmm. and we all know what's the hotbed of development yeah south lubbock and so i think the market will put pressure on them and i think you'll see council continue over the next few years probably to work on those agreements okay and um, we're getting some land up north close to the airport. Um, what uh, I'm assuming from what I read, um, I mean, I'm, all I've got is what's been reported. Um, 
it's just kind of a lot of cosmetic work of getting everything whole. In other words, there's a lot of patches that need to be filled in. I, th- I think that's a good good description of it. Um, there's a lot of land around the airport, our own airport, that wasn't in the city limits that we felt like needed to be included. And I, g- I guess keep in mind, we didn't make any decisions on that piece last night. Uh-huh. Um, there's a process to this. We have a citizen-led uh, annexation and growth committee, and they work all year study it, identify areas that they think would be would best serve being included in the city. And also keep in mind that all this annexation works within the confines of, of state law. Right. Okay. State law defines annexation. And so um, this is a recommendation. And all we did last night on the piece you mentioned was that we've directed the staff to dis- to do the research to determine if it was even feasible feasible to annex that piece of property. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that takes in, you'll recall the council annexed a piece of property, which was the Monsanto project north of town. And there was a big gap between the city limits and Monsanto mm-hmm. of, of, of land that was not in the city limits. So to your, I think you described it best. It's a lot of cleanup around the airport. And it's also that cleanup of that contiguous, contiguous land between the current city limits and Monsanto. Yeah, and the new um, the new state law on annexation will not affect Lubbock at all, right? Because I think it's for counties that are a million or more, something to that extent. Larger than five hundred thousand. Well, five hundred thousand. So, um, so but anyway, so there's there's nothing major. You're not like pulling in huge communities or anything like that. This is just land that's out there that needs to be cleaned up. Yeah, and again, all all that was done last night, I just want to be clear, we did not annex those pieces of property. All we did was uh, that was a recommendation from the annexation committee, and we directed staff to take a look and said, say, is this realistic to, 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 to consider this for annexation? Mm-hmm. So there's been some reports on the North and East Lubbock CDC. And so while we have you here, I know that uh, the mayor's commented on it a little bit, and um, there's just some information out there. I think something like 92, 95% of their budget is spent on administration. Um, and so you had something last night about it, but y'all didn't really hit on that a lot. Yeah. Uh, city manager's done some work on this. He's uh, just updated us and let us know that he'll have a full report uh, and recommendation uh, on what we do with the portion of our budget that is in LCDC on September 14th. Uh, you're correct. When you analyze those financials, I believe um, they're looks like they're spending about 91% on admin. Just to remind everybody, in ELCDC, the purpose is it, they're, 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 they get funding from the city, uh, 400 something thousand, and um, um, their purpose is to promote economic development in East Lubbock, which there is a need for. Uh, I think if you're going to promote economic development, uh, you start with people making making it creating the situation where people can live in East Lubbock and that means housetops. So I'd like to see that money focus much more on rooftops than admin. I, th- I think there's a spirit in the council right now uh, to, to do something about the NL- NELCDC. I think it's undetermined on what that path forward is, but I think the you can look forward to a spirited discussion on September 14th. So- well, there's some music. We'll take a break and uh, at this point and come back on the other side and talk more with uh, your city councilman, uh, Steve Massingale. News Talk, 95.1 FM and 790 AM. We are KFYO Mornings with Dave King and Matt Martin broadcasting live from the Culligan Water Studios, Better Water, Pure and Simple. Going to the text board this morning from the 773, we have a text message regarding annexation that we were talking about. Uh, on the other side of the break. Is this one of those one-sided things where you get to decide about the owner's property, or do they also get input? Well, we're talking with City Councilman Steve Massengale. You have an answer? Of course they get input. <laughs> there, there, there will be hearings. So, uh, Just like we'd had, we've had two hearings um, prior to the first reading on the 212 agreements last night, so um, there will be opportunity for input. Yeah. Sure. Annexation, when you're uh, annexing someone's existing property, turns into an emotional situation you sh- many times, doesn't it? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I I would think it would be emotional for anybody. Yeah. Um, 
the frat house. That was interesting. Oh, the non-frat house. <laughs> uh, the non-frat house. The wannabe frat house. Uh, th- th- we had an item last night of um, uh, an appeal of a decision from our planning and zoning commission, uh, which uh, turned down this request 7-0. And then uh, when, when an appeal comes to council on that, it has to pass 6-1. to one to overturn planning and zoning. This was a home over in the heart of Lubbock, uh, a neighborhood association or O'Neill Terrace, which to orient folks is um, the uh, northwest corner of 34th and back behind 34th and Q. And uh, there's some beautiful older homes over there. And, uh, you know, the neighbors were there last night, and I thought they did a great job talking about their neighborhood. Um, they love their neighborhood. It's a single. It's a. It's a neighborhood designed for single family residences. And uh, I did not realize that's where it is. I, I mean, I had a good. Friend I, I, I promise there. you, if There's, I showed you the front of this house, you'd be like, "Oh, I've seen that house." There are many people. If when you say thirty fourth and Q, they cannot get a visual image of beautiful homes in that area. Well, right behind, that, yes, I'm sir, telling you, right you're behind right. there are some gorgeous historical large homes. Yeah, uh, in Lubbock. And so I'm wondering what. <laughs> I'm trying to get this image in my head. So we have a fraternity that says, ah, this would be a good place for a frat house. Did it not dawn on anyone that frat house in a residential, high-end high, high end residential community might not be a good idea? Yeah, I, I can't talk, speak to how they, I mean, the frat fraternity had already purchased the house and how they got to the point of purchasing it or who might have influenced them to purchase it but and they certainly a, sure the residents will welcome you and it's certainly a head scratcher and uh you know they have two individuals living in there and right now the code the code calls for no more than two unrelated people living in a single family residence so they'll obviously need to take do something with that property at this point but it's gorgeous property i mean gorgeous house and uh what happened is uh, we had a, a hearing on it had many citizens talk, and uh, it uh, died at the dais for lack of emotion. So, so it's not going to be a frat house. It is not. I, I would have been very surprised if that had have passed. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that would have been surprising. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want a frat house in my neighborhood, and that's that's what I was telling people <laughs> yesterday. I'm like. Oh, I think they should pass it since it's not in my neighborhood. Well, I don't, <laughs> but when and, you look at things that way, it's like <laughs> the people in that neighborhood don't they don't want the same thing. And that's not to diminish our college community. We're no, a college not at town. All. Uh this is was nothing against fraternities. This was about um quality of life in our in our neighborhoods and how important our neighborhoods are to us. And there's a place for them to have a frat house. And um Hopefully, well, hopefully well, they can recover from so that and find a place to. We have a Greek circle out there, uh, which is all fraternity and sorority houses, is it not? I and think it's getting pretty full. It's, it's yeah. full, and that's yeah. that's what I heard. Is there not is there not room to expand that area? Because it seems to me that that's the ideal situation. You put them all together. And I think there's a lot of positives about that. I, th- I think that's the point. Is I don't know that there's any. You know, soccer now backs up to Greek mm. circle. Um, I think you've got the innovation hub coming in from the uh, on that land coming in from the north, or if I, I think it's that same corner. So land is a premium over there right now. Yeah. And um, anyway, yeah, definitely. Um, so there's there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, LPNL had their first uh, meeting, and they're they're going to have more. Is the city council involved in that at all? Are you talking about the public meetings? The public meetings okay, for tomorrow is now. the first public meeting. Oh, it's meeting. tomorrow. Okay. Um, so they're going to have kind of some workshop uh, situations for people to uh, come understand what you know. Even last night we had you know people. The, the bill is confusing. Let, let, let's just let's just call it what it is. People are confused about you know the, the, does LPNL pick up the trash. Well, PNL doesn't pick up your trash. The city of Lubbock picks up your trash, although we have an arrangement where you get billed all on the same piece of paper for your trash pickup. And I think 
you have cost recovery and the, the way we bill is very confusing. And I think we've got some mechanisms to make it easier on some folks. Um, we probably have some cult customer service culture culture issues at LPNL, so definitely got some things to work on there. So we're going to hold you over. Okay, Can we fine. do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, there's the music, and we've got to take that 7.30 break this morning. Again, this is KFYO Mornings with Dave King and Matt Martin, 69 degrees and uh, 7.29 right now, and we're talking with Councilman Steve, City Councilman Steve Massengill. We'll take the break and come right back and close things out. News Talk, 95.1 FM and 790 AM. We are KFYO Mornings with Dave King and Matt Martin. It is 736 AM and 69 degrees as you're getting up. And we're talking with Lubbock City Councilman Steve Massengill of District 4. The, uh, I think our last topic is, is the, um, the, 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 new, the new police. What do we call that? Well, right yeah. now it's referred to as the Public Safety Facilities Proposal. Uh, it's, it's it includes it's going a, to be neighborhood policing. It includes a few facilities, uh, three substations, one east, one north, one south, a police admin building downtown, a municipal court, and a police evidence property warehouse. Downtown. Yeah, so, the, the warehouse would be out on Municipal Hill where the old animal services building so used to be. So the municipal court is for sure not going to be in Citizens Tower now? There's no, there's absolutely, it was never going to oh, be okay. in Citizens Tower. okay. There's no room for it. Okay. I mean, when we move into Citizens Tower, it's full. Okay, it seems like, well, just looking at this, that that's a pretty good idea to have these substations around. Uh, is What is the advantage? Is it better response times? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, response times can be affected. Um, the uh, interaction with the community and the public is improved. Um you know, I think long term when we do a south substation, we anticipate we'd like to have a detention, a temporary holding facility out mm-hmm. there as well. Now, if we, uh, you know, if we make a property arrest in South Lubbock, <clears throat> we drive all the way to the air, you know, yeah, to the to the jail that's east of the airport and back, and sometimes that takes an officer on the str- off the street for two hours, and so all of this would be in an effort to become more efficient and uh, get closer to the public. And you could have, I guess, a, like a a, a mini bus or something that just made the made the routes to the to the jail and I call it a paddy wagon. A paddy, paddy wagon. wagon. There's a, that's a better term. Uh, but yeah, you would. This seemed like that's more, far more efficient, and you you got one dedicated officer or two perhaps that that run the paddy wagon route. Yeah, and that when we get to that point, that would be a cooperative effort. We would hope it would be a cooperative effort with all the law enforcement in the area, DPS. So will there be detectives as well as uniformed policemen and? Sure. All these. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'll just describe one of these substations to you. It kind of, it's got, it, it, it's got a lobby and, um, it, it, it'll always have an officer right there at a front desk that, that you can interact with, um, have a couple of interview rooms off to the side. If you need to have a private conversation with a police officer, if you need to pick up a report or you need to talk about something, they usually have community rooms in them. I mean, you could have your, um, there for the, um, Officers can use it to have their meetings, but if you wanted to have an evening community meeting, you could have it there. Mm-hmm. So, so about this, something y'all, I don't think went over last night. Y'all went over a couple weeks ago was the price tag, which is going to be around, I think, sixty million dollars. Yeah, we believe it'll cost sixty million dollars. Mm-hmm. And so, from that, um, just talking, I think we talked to Councilman Griffith last week. Um, he didn't think that there should be a bond election; that y'all should just issue bonds from the council. Um, so what are your thoughts on that as far as, uh, how to move forward getting those funds? Well, uh, Councilman and Griffith and I disagree on this point. Um, I believe this is a project that we should include the voters in. Um, so I think council's leaning towards t- doing COs. The, t- the tax impact is three cents. Um, uh, we don't have a way to fund the $60 million. It would increase taxes. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we know what the, the price is going to, how much it's going to cost, and uh, we believe that it's a need, not a want. And that's what that's what we did last night. Is uh, we directed the city manager in the next ninety days to conduct um, a, a series of meetings and or communicate with the public about, you know, the benefits of community policing, exactly what these facilities would look like. I think we'd like to open up. Um, 
uh, our current police headquarters and, and let our citizens see the condition of that facility. We, we always talk about that that building's run down. Let's show everybody what it really looks like and show how it's misconfigured and how we can, you know, let's just, let's talk about uh, how we will use the money and how we will make our police force better with it. Well, I think the community would easily be behind you on this. I think people actually want the police closer to where they're at. Um, and like, you know, we said kind of during the break, there's been some some things we've seen as far as crimes concerned lately that I think concern people. Um, most of it's not going to be, uh, you know, if, if you're not in a certain lifestyle, you're probably not going to see that crime. But nonetheless, they want that that uh, peace that <laughs> comes from having the police much closer. Yeah, you know, we... W- as a as a councilman, I hear about property crimes, and you know what, crime doesn't discriminate. I don't care what neighborhood you live in; it doesn't. You, it's in everybody's neighborhood, and um, everybody would like to see a stop put to that. And um, I mean, this isn't this isn't the magic potion to fix all crime, but it's it's certainly a move. We're, we're not the small town we were when we moved police HQ into the old a building that was built in 1934. Okay. We're not that town. We're a large city. We're the 11th largest city in the state of Texas. And this community policing, this, this model with substations decentralized is, has got, has been overwhelmingly supported wherever we go in the community. And so I think it's incumbent on us to communicate the components of the proposal what we're paying for and how it's going to benefit us. Well, you know, just as as a citizen and just as an observer of the city, been here for fifty years, I've just never seen the city boom like it has just in the last few years. I mean, it's, it, you talk about the city. Uh, uh, you know, I think we have reached a point where we're not a little town anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are a big city. We are. We got big city problems, and we ne- we're going to have to address those. And I know that this uh, police station has been an issue. Uh, it, that thing has been run down, and uh, builders and people in the real estate business have looked at it and said the only thing that 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 you can do with that building is take a wrecking ball to it yeah yeah and so it that needs to be addressed and i think i think we're going the right direction with the community policing you you know to illustrate the need um and the mayor the mayor's made this comment he he and i were part of it we were in leadership lubbock together in the 90s and when we toured that building together it needed to be replaced then yes Mm -hmm. And they're still using it. And we've just kicked it down. We've kicked this problem down the road for too long. And I think uh, you've got the support on this council to uh, get it resolved. So uh, we only have just a few more minutes left. So let me ask uh, just overall budgets. Um, in the budget, it's showing that LPNL is helping to pay for Citizens Tower. Mm-hmm. So how much of Citizens Tower is LPNL paying for? Oh, I, I don't have those figures in front of me right now, but... I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk about this, but it, it's a it, it's a model that makes sense. I mean, if you were in a building and you had and you 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 someone was using space, I mean, you've been in the real estate business. I mean, they're going to pay for the space they're using. Uh, there, there are other departments that will pay for the space they're using, uh, primarily inter- enterprise funds. So uh, they're paying. They have a building now that that costs them money. Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a good way to justify them being in the building, and it's a good method to make sure we we're paying for it correctly. Okay. Well, and and the other question I had, as far as that's concerned, is them moving from where they are now over to Citizens Tower? Is that going to raise possibly the rates for LP and L people getting electricity from? No, I, there's no indication that that that's going to happen. And then we'll sell. Um, the the building that they're currently in, put it okay. back on the tax roll. Let's do this text message this, this morning. This is a, a message that has just come in from the 401. It says, the problem isn't the bill. He's referring to the LPNL bill. Mm-hmm. The problem is the spike in the bill when the homeowner hasn't used more water or power during the month. We understand how to read the bill, and we understand the city collects the garbage, not LPNL. Also, most people don't believe the meters are red. Um. All, and I don't know how you can respond to that. But. Uh, I mean, all good points. I mean, if they understand, I'm glad they understand the bill because sometimes even I don't understand the bill. So, uh, you know, we had a citizen last night that was confused about who collected the garbage. So uh, I understand the, the 
the the spike and uh, you, i think you'll see when we adopt the budget that we are adopting a different way to charge um for water uh we're gonna um uh lose the method of the average winter consumption which is a this is if you use more in the winter you pay less in the summer which that doesn't make any sense and so i i, I think we're going to make some incremental changes that I, that I hope will help. And I think as you see this new bill come out with LPNL uh, or the, and the city utilities, I hope it's easier to understand. Okay. Well, uh, that's, uh, we about just covered everything. Okay. Well, we're so glad that, uh, that you uh, came in this morning. Uh, Councilman Steve Massengale, we appreciate you taking the time to explain to our audience, uh, you know, some questions that is of interest to them. And we'll take this break. And uh, be back on the other side with more.